article, the way they, uh, the writer answers, listed a lot of factors, which is all of them true, really. For example, uh, the leadership and bureaucracy stranded in Iraqi Kurdistan, the KRG put them restriction on them, so there is a gap between them and the people inside. At the same time, uh, in Iranian, there is some changes, reformists have open a horizon for some more intellectuals, so they lost it. All of them true, but the difficulty is actually, still we don't know how and why, in what course of history really the Iranian curve or the political party of Iranian Kurdistan ended up in this way. What uh, course of history really brought them to this point, and how and why? In answering this question really, Mm, I have to go back because when we're talking about the Kurdish National Movement in Iran, we're talking about the political Islam and its relation with this, uh, and we're talking about the, a, a very dark period of the Kurdish National Movement, 1975 to 80s, which is we had the heaviest repression in Iraqi Kurdistan. It affected the rest of the Kurdistan, thousand villages really, uh, just. Uh, destroyed they, to create a uh, security belt and it affected the whole Kurdish national movement. And the change came, the change came during the Iranian revolution. When in Iranian side, the Kurdish activists, very young Kurdish activists, in the process of the Iranian revolution, came on the street and created a kind of secular platform which was acting independent of Tehran and the rest of the revolution. And at the same time, they opened the networking and contact with the Arabic Peshmerga, which by the time they were stranded in the valley called Khranauzang. Uh, you heard the Mam Jalal a lot of time repeating, one day two Iranian Kurds, they called, Iranian came to Khranauzang and they wanted to see me. One of them had $3,000, one of them had rucksack out the medicine. And Mom Jalal repeating this one, this is so important for us all that. That's what the situation they were there. But of course, from 1975, the collapse of monarchy, we had in Iranian Kurdistan a mass movement, and that mass movement opened the border, and we have the resurgence of the Kurdish nationalism in both border, really. And so here, when you're talking about the relation with the political Islam and and the Kurdish nationalist movement in that period, we have, we have to talk about the political Islam as well. Of course, you know better than me, the concept of political Islam is, in political theory, is very contested, really. There is different definition, different connotation of what political Islam means, and they have really different normative value. So, to, to have, very briefly, first I'm, um, uh, Quoting from the Oliver Roy, which is basically saying, very simply, Islamism was created both along the line and as a break from Salafia. The Islamists generally adopt Salafia the theology. They preach a return to Quran, to Sunnah, and the Sharia, and they reject the commentary that have been part of the tra tradition. They therefore demand the right to ishtihad, which is independent. Uh, interpretation or individual interpretation, but they don't stop there. That's the most important. They, <coughs> three point, separate them from the uh, ulama or fundamentalist ulama or traditional ulama, which is one is the political revolution, second is the sharia, but the, the way they use the sharia and the issue of the women or the position of women within the society. Along this one, mainly I am in favor of Sami Zubaydah and his theory or his, his work on the political Islam, along this one coming another definition, which is basically we have, we have uh, a kind of tripartite typology. First is the conservative Islam. By conservative Islam, we argue, or this definition argue, is the conservative Islam is that really trying to have, to establish moral uh, and social control or the citizen. The Gulf state, that Saudi Arabia is the best example. And then we have the radical Islam, which is in Iran particularly famous 
Abraham and has a book on Mujahideen, Khal Radical Islam. This is a kind of political group, Islamist group, which is basically uh, building on the contemporary ideology, blending with Islam and trying to overthrow the non-Islamic ruler and create an Islamic and radical state. The third one is the political Islam, which is, according to Sami Zubaydah, which I am coming from that line, the political Islam differ really from the both this kind of Islamism. In a sense, in a sense, first of all, they want to reform society and politics, but at the same time, within this process, they represent both a continuity and negative response to the leftist and nas secular nationalist forces. In a sense, if I just briefly say, political Islam is a form of Islamism. It's not the, so we have to make that distinction. Why I think it's important, because in Iranian society, during the stormy months of the building up the momentum of the revolution, we have really different group. We had the moderate Islamic forces, which is was the liberation movement of Iran. We have Mujahideen Khal. We have conservative uh, Islam and different. All of them really represented. The, the moderate and the radical one, which they were very powerful, at least the Mujahideen, they were very powerful, and they had very strong uh, network, but really both moderate and the radical, they failed to secure the power. And instead, what happened in Iran after at least, saying, uh, a year after the collapse of monarchy, uh, power gravitated into hand of Ayatollah Khomeini and the clergy who support them. And this is Khomeini himself, you are familiar. This is from his book, from his lecture in Najaf, actually. What he's saying is the quotation that Islam is a program for life and the government. It has provided government for 15 years and more. Khomeini is not very accurate in when talking. In the time he was saying, it was, I think, uh, 68, 69, the lecture. Uh, it, is uh, it is more than a few words on morality. Islam has a political agenda and provide for administration and a country. So this is the Khomeini. During this period, when the Kurdish national movement, the surge of the Kurdish national movement in Iran and Kurdistan happening, we face the situation which is this line of Islamism, where this kind of political Islam came to power. And there is a process which is in that process we have to discuss the Kurdish nationalist movement. What happening is, looking back in all these years, basically, one could observe, observe or suggest no other issue plagued the Islamist and Islamic Republic as continuing as the Kurdish nationalist movement in all these years. At the same time, of course, the Kurdish national movement was a mass movement. It was a social entity with the political representative, completely independent of the uh, Tehran and the rest of Iran, and they were armed as well. Uh, this situation, almost, uh, this is a kind of situation where almost the monarchy happened. There was very little agreement between what the Kurd, what that Kurdish nationalist is saying, and what the newly government, the provisional government was saying. Of course, provisional government trying very hard, really, to have fine deal with the Kurdish issue, but it was, there was a possibility. So we have a courses. The first clash came in March 1975, in, on the eve of Nowruz, really, in San Andaj, the clashes happened between the a part of the Shia citizen of the city with the Sunni one, then it became became a full-scale war in San Andres, which is very famous. And the next came when in May, they have a referendum and the change of the name of the regime from monarchy to Islamic Republic. Of course, Kurt didn't participate. But the most important, in July 1975, they have assembly of experts, which allowed that assembly pro Khomeini forces to pass constitution or discuss at least the constitution with the, that close of Belayat Fari, and effectively they purge and silence all other oppositional forces 
and even some of this then clear the divorces. And although in that constitution we have Article 12 to 14, which is talking about the minority, but the mi by minority they mean really. Uh, they mean uh, religious minority. Four, four minutes? Last four minutes. Okay. The Kurd strongly opposed that change in all this process. So, if I, because I haven't got time, I skip this one. Uh, so, the Kurdish nationalist movement, my argument is, really after the revolution, was the only viable forces uh, which is could challenge or came as challenge the domination of Islamists and at the, ab at the absence of other uh, powerful Iranian forces. But the movement caught unguarded and after 15 years of heavy and difficult arm struggle, they lost the battle militarily. The question is why? Some of the writers, for example, McDowell, talking about disunity among the Kurds or discord among the Islamists. Of course, disunity among the Kurds is, was important, but I think in general, in general, it wasn't only this uh, unity because this unity came, and that's why I think three phases is very important in this process. Uh, one is the February uh, 1975 to 80s, which is basically. There was a kind of alliance between the Kurds. They try and negotiate to have peaceful resolution with the Tehran, which is impossible. And then we have from late 80s to 85, which is even KDPI came to overthrow the Islamic Republic, and Komal and KDPI, and there is heavy fighting, really heavy fighting, which is uh, in Kurdistan. Uh, but by 85, really almost the regime won the military battle. Excuse me? Gentlemen, still tell them I'm not here, okay? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, so to conclude, why it happened really, if we discuss why it happened and what's the implication for today, I think two, two points mainly in my conclusion. One is, of course, there was some problem which is imposed on the Kurds uh, by real politics and geopolitical imperative of the region, or by others under this background. Hashem is here. I think it, it's my memory not failing me because I'm not feeling very well. It was in 2009 or 2009 when the incursion happened in Turkey and we had a seminar, a conference in Chatham House. Hashim has a paper in the afternoon. In the morning, in the morning, we had a very interesting panel out there, some politicians and journalists about the situation. And there was Sir Ger uh, Jeremy Greenstock give a speech. Very interesting speech, actually. And uh, he was the ambassador, British ambassador in Iran by the time of, uh, no, not the time, in the beginning, but, but retired by the time. He very trained uh, uh, British politician, uh, diplomat. And he started by saying a story, uh, saying one day uh, Jalal Talabani and Masoud Barzani came to us, asked for a meeting, and we went in the late evening. And they came with a proposal. The proposal was, we support you, we are with you to the end, but we need one thing from you. If everything happened, uh, fail in Iraq, we need your guarantee. If we declare independence, you support us. And he uh, said, Jeremy Scott saying, the problem, so, okay, no problem. And I said, I touched him. Can we have a break? And then say in the outside, I don't know how Hashem is remember that one or not. In the outside, say, what are you doing, you stupid? He said, no, it's very good. He said, no, no, contact Washington. Anyway, they postponed the meeting. In the next morning, they said, we cannot do that. The rest of the speech was why he done that one. And basically, if I say that kind of uh, impose on the kid, it's a kind of, kind of, kind of theory of catch-22, really. 
they created for the Kurd. And his answer was, of course, the Kurds was a great nation. They should have independence. They are entitled. But considering the situation in the region and considering the, our national interest, we have to keep Iraq together. And at the moment, our national interest cannot afford allowed to care to be independent. This is a kind of theory imposed on the Kurd. And but the second point is there is some Kurd himself really pose some problem on themselves, especially the leader of the Kurd really, which is easily cannot be shaken off. And this is a kind of under that pressure really, under that pressure they have all the readers, particularly Dr. Qasim Lu uh, okay, two minutes uh, two minutes. Because for me, what's interesting, the last interview of Dr. Qasim, the two last interview of Dr. Qasim, is very, he's very articulate about the political situation in Iran, and, but at the same time, he never fed away about that solution. He clearly is saying, saying, at the moment, we cannot overthrow the regime, we, have not, we don't have a partner in Iran, but still we have to continue the same strategy, democracy for Iran, autonomy for Kurdistan. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in that sense, the Kurd convinced under that pressure, okay, uh, at least the Kurdish there, they failed to have their own theory of secession or national definition of national uh, self-intermination uh, and uh, to, uh, uh, have argument against the idea, the idea which is trying to sell uh, in practice self-determination and sovereignty attached to the state, not to the nation. And that interpretation is so negative. Why? First of all, it loses the moral power. I can secondly, it loses the political power. Unfortunately, under that pressure and Cash 22, they never the Kurdish leader really said. And why is it important for today? Because, because if the Kurd in Iran for 15 years has the the most manpower against the Islamists, and they lost the power. They can happen in Rojava, they can happen in Bashur as well. And that's why we have to run from that one, and the Kurds should have really their own interpretation of self-determination, what does mean, and one day to stand against that one. Thank you very much. Okay.